Hey guys, it's Anthony Bandier here bringing a roadside chat. Question is, when it comes to stop and identify statutes, does the person actually have to give more than just their name? Okay, so this question comes from an officer in Nevada and it's really something that I've been seeing come up more and more, at least in Nevada, where there's an argument being made by some defense attorneys that are saying, when you, because Nevada has a stop and identify statute, it's NRS, Nevada Revised Statute 171.123, and it says that upon being detained for reasonable suspicion, um, the person, you know, uh, shall identify themselves and so forth, right? In so many words. And many other states have this. Now, some states don't have it, uh, California being one of them, but a lot of states do have a stop and identify type statute. The question, though, is when we look at, a, when we look at the only Supreme Court case on this issue, it's called Hybel. Some people say Hybel. I think it's Hybel, but I'm not, I'm not positive. But it's, I think it's H-I-I-B-E-L. Um, in fact, I probably have it here, but anyway, so, um, yeah, it's H I I B E L. So what happened in high bull, and that's, that's a case from Nevada, by the way, dealing with this NRS, what happened there was an officer stopped high bull for suspected of being involved in a domestic violence. It was an investigative detention, wasn't probable cause. And the, um, high bull refused to identify himself per the statute and he was arrested. Well, it goes to the U S Supreme court and the good news and the bad news. The good news is they upheld Nevada's stop and identify statute. They said that this was lawful under the Fourth Amendment. The bad news, though, is when, when they wrote the case, they kind of made it like seem like all you have to give is your name, right? Um, in so many words, they're like, you, you know, a person uh, would have to give their name, you know, but they didn't say really I identification. Now, I think, quite frankly, it's a little bit sloppy language. I don't think they meant literally all you have to give is your name and nothing else. Because if that was the case, people with generic names probably could not be adequately identified. Um, the issue in Hybel wasn't that wasn't that he gave just his name. He gave nothing. So the U.S. Supreme Court was not really dealing with how much information. So here is my advice. Okay. When it comes to dealing with these issues. You know, talk to your prosecutor. I'm, you know, I'm not your attorney, right? But I'm just saying, like, what I'm looking for when my officers are dealing with this issue, I'm looking for two things. Number one, try to identify them with without arresting them for some kind of obstruction, right? If they have a unique name, and that's all they give you, but they have a unique name, and you can run them in your database, and he pops or she pops up, and you're like, yes. That's the person. The fact that they didn't want to give you their date of birth, the fact that they didn't want to give you their social security number, whatever you're looking for, who cares? If you can identify them, move on. If they're driving in a car, okay, and you run the plate, the registered owner appears to be that person, and they're you know they're playing games, but they don't want to really give you much more. But it's a reasonable suspicion stop. They don't have, you don't have probable cause to arrest for anything else, and you think it's that person, move on, right? That's their identity. Okay, that's the first thing. Try to just do, use your tools is what I'm trying to say. The second thing is, fine, they give you, you know, uh, Anthony Smith as their name, right? And you think they're not lying. If they're lying, that can come up as obstruction. But they're not really giving you much more information than that. The second question is, before you start pulling the trigger on arresting somebody or, you know, you know, you can't cite somebody if you don't know who they are, but ultimately going to arrest somebody, the next question is, does it really matter? What investigation are you trying to figure out here where identify them really makes a difference? Let me give you an example. Walmart says, hey, look, we have a shoplifter here. We told him to stop. He didn't stop. He kept on walking. We don't put hands on people um, you know, in our store, so we couldn't put hands on him. We couldn't detain him. This is what they look like. The cop gets in the area a couple minutes later, whatever, sees the person walking, thinks that it is him, detains him. And he says, the officer says, hey, uh, you're, you're a suspect in a shoplifting incident. What is your information? The guy says, I, I didn't shoplift. Well, the cop says, well, look, you know, you, you kind of match your description, um, good enough for government work type thing. Uh, so what is your information? He says, I'm not giving you anything, right? I, I'm, I, I didn't do anything wrong. And the officer then gets a call over the radio that they actually found the shoplifter on the other side of Walmart. Uh, witness, the, the loss prevention officer, everybody says, look, we got the guy. You happened to stop the wrong person. Now, it wasn't a bad stop. It just was the wrong person, right? This is reasonable suspicion. It's not certainty. 
but yet the person refused to identify themselves. What are you going to do? Are you going to be like, you know what? I found that you're not the shoplifter, but because you didn't identify yourself, you're now going to go to jail for refusing to identify. Is that your move? I would caution you against it. So I would use, if the case I'm going to use to caution you against this is United States versus Christian. It's a case of the Ninth Circuit, 2004. And they talked about basically demanding a person's identity. They said, we can do it. Okay, you can do it. However, they also threw in there that demanding a suspect identification during a Terry stop, so long as the request is reasonably related to the detention. Here's my problem now. Once, you, look, I, I like demanding the, I, the person's ID if you work in a stop and identify sta state, right? You know, I think like half the states don't have this law. So really, it's, a, it's an empty threat. You can't arrest somebody for refusing to identify in a state like California because that is not a requirement there. But go back to Nevada. Fine, you should, you should try to identify them because if they have a history of shoplifting, that's going to help confirm that this is probably our guy, right? For example. But now that you know it's not him, what's the reason? What's the, what's the purpose now? It, it's gone away. And what I want you to do is let the guy go, right? That's what I want you to do. That's making good case law. Don't let your ego or anything like that get in the way. Because if you put handcuffs on that guy and you go to court and you're like, why are we here, officer? And you tell him the whole story I just told you, I don't think the judge is going to be very happy that the guy took a ride to jail under these facts, okay? Sure, he should have identified himself initially, but now it's game over. The guy is not the person. We should just let him go. That's my suggestion. That's what I would do. But you do you. If you think I'm wrong in the law, then uh, that's okay too. So I hope this has helped. Keep the questions coming. Until next time, my friends, uh, stay safe out there. Thank you.